How are you? This here's Miss Bonnie Parker. Glad to meet you. I'm Clyde Barron. Clyde. We robbed banks. Hi, this is Ed Driscoll. Welcome to Silicon Graffiti. This past summer, Rick Perlstein, the author of a new biography called Nixonland, looked back on the period leading up to Richard Nixon's inauguration in 1968 and told Reason Magazine that in his opinion, quote, Bonnie and Clyde was the most important text of the new left, unquote. Perlstein added that it made an argument about vitality and virtue versus staidness and morality that was completely new, that resonated with young people in a way that made no sense to old people. Just the idea that the outlaws were the good guys and the bourgeois householders were the bad guys. You cannot underestimate how strange and fresh that was." Unquote. It certainly was strange compared with the nation's politics at the start of the 1960s. Obviously, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the touchstone moment of the 1960s, was a key factor. As James Pearson, the author of Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, told Peter Robinson of the Hoover Institute earlier this year. The liberalism that came out of the New Deal was a very optimistic liberalism about the future and about America's role in the world and the role of the federal government in perfecting our democracy. Kennedy constantly talked about the future, uh, and the future was going to be brighter than the past. What happened in the 1960s was that that assumption of American progress among liberals was shattered. Uh, the belief in American benevolence, uh, of America's role in the world, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the American past, all these were called into question by the liberals in the 1960s. And one of the things that the assassination contributed was this idea that America is guilty. The cultural sophisticates, the cultural liberals, beginning in the 1960s, embraced this idea that America uh, is guilty of uh, manifold sins. Kennedy didn't believe that. But out of his assassination, this, this was the, his assassination and its aftermath was the first time this was placed on public view that the nation is guilty. The 1967 release of Bonnie and Clyde coincided, and arguably helped to fuel, a period in which the radical far left and the more controlled and moderate style New Deal liberalism began to merge. Not coincidentally, this was also the period when traditional morality began to break down. Mick Jagger's lyrics to the Rolling Stones' hit 1968 song, Sympathy for the Devil, called the philosophy of the day, Heads His Tails. 1968 was also the year that Bobby Kennedy, who only a few years previously had served as the Attorney General in his brother's administration, quoted early 20th century progressive William Allen White in a speech to students at Kansas State University. If our colleges and universities do not breed men who riot, who rebel, who attack life with all the youthful vision and vigor, then there is something wrong with our colleges. The more riots that come on college campuses, the better the world for tomorrow. According to Vanity Fair magazine, Kennedy concluded his speech by raising his fist in the air so that it, quote, resembled the revolutionary symbol on posters hanging on student rooms that year and promised a, quote, new America to the students he spoke to. Kennedy would certainly get his wish, sadly far more so than he could possibly have anticipated. But more on that in just a few moments. Bonnie and Clyde didn't just fuel radical new left politics, it had a surprising and lasting impact on pop culture as a whole. If, as Rick Perlstein told Reason Magazine, the power of the movie came from its point of view that, quote, the outlaws were the good guys and the bourgeois householders the bad guys, then its cultural impact came from the most unlikely of sources, the staid New Yorker magazine, then eagerly read weekly by plenty of bourgeois householders. To most newspaper film critics of the day, Bonnie and Clyde was just drive-in fodder. Even Jack Warner, then the head of Warner Brothers, didn't understand the movie when director Arthur Penn first screened it for him. We went out to uh, Jack's house, and then finally the film ended. 
And he said, what the hell is this? And it was kind of quiet in the room. And then Warren said, well, you know, Jack, what it is really is uh, an homage to the great gangster films of the wonderful Warner Brothers era. And Jack sort of bit that in me. And then he looked at Warren and said, what the f is an homage? But in her first film review for The New Yorker, Pauline Kael saw something new and radically different in Bonnie and Clyde. As Robert Fulford wrote in Canada's National Post this past July, Pauline Kael announced no less than a revolution in taste that she sensed was in the air. Movie audiences, she said, were going beyond, quote, good taste, moving into a period of greater freedom and openness. Was it a violent film, Fulford asked 41 years after its debut? Quote, Bonnie and Clyde needs violence. Violence is its meaning, Kael wrote in 1967. And violence quickly became the meaning of the late 1960s. Five years after John F. Kennedy was killed, a victim of the International Cold War, Bobby Kennedy was murdered by Sirhan Sirhan, making RFK arguably the first American victim of a quickly radicalizing Middle East. Martin Luther King was also assassinated in 1968. The Democratic Convention in Chicago was disrupted, to say the least, by the far left. Voters looked at the violence of 1968 and had one solution to it. They elected Richard Nixon, who ran on a ticket promising law and order. But the culture seemed permanently altered. In 1973, Daniel Patrick Moynihan concluded that, quote, most liberals had ended the 1960s rather ashamed of the beliefs they had held at the beginning of the decade. And even after Richard Nixon took office in early 1969, radical chic remained the chief style of the new left, a style which has echoes in today's politics. John, take me back to 1970. How old were you then? I was nine, about six months older than the senator. What uh, was your father's occupation? My uh, dad at the time was a New York State judge, trial court judge here in Manhattan. All right, so now the, the, those two questions are very relevant. Uh, so tell us now, what happened back in February of 1970? At the time, Greta, my uh, father was the trial judge on a case called the Panther 21. A uh, number of members of the Black Panther Party on trial for allegedly plotting to uh, bomb uh, a number of landmarks and department stores here in New York City. Uh, February 21st, 1970, in the midst of that trial at about 4, 4.30 in the morning, uh, William Ayers uh, Weather Underground uh, frankly launched an attack on about four different sites here in New York. They attacked two military recruiting installations in Brooklyn, they attacked a police installation in Lower Manhattan, and then they attacked uh, my family home with us sleeping in our beds uh, with three separate bombs. Bonnie and Clyde's radical influence even spread to Europe, as Austin Bay and Jim Dunnigan note in the latest edition of their best-selling A Quick and Dirty Guide to War. They write that, quote, The German Red Army faction, RAF, was led by two terrorists, Andreas Bader and Ulrich Meinhof. That a smart television producer could connect to the Depression-era American gangsters Bonnie and Clyde. Hollywood had given Bonnie and Clyde high visibility in 1967, with a hit picture starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. The RAF appeared in 1968. Between terrorist acts, the RAF robbed banks like Bonnie and Clyde, or Bonnie und Clyde, as Time Magazine would eventually dub the German terror couple. In his recent National Post look at Pauline Kael and the 1967 film she championed, Robert Fulford wrote that, quote, Kael assumed that she was safe to defend the choices of mass audiences because the old standards of taste would always be there. They were, after all, built into the culture but those standards were swiftly eroded. After Kale's death in 2001, screenwriter Paul Schrader, whom Kale initially championed, who would go on to write a plethora of violent films such as Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, the successors to the new left genre opened up by Bonnie and Clyde, wrote that it was fun watching the apple cart being upset, but now where do we go for the apples? Which may have been Bonnie and Clyde's greatest theft of all. For Silicon Graffiti, I'm Ed Driscoll.